somehow you bring dead things back to life and it might look like it's as over as a stone over a grave but i've seen you window feels like freedom on my face it really is a new beginning it really is amazing grace thank god for sunday morning thank god for 316 Was a time that I swore I would never go back. I was blind to the truth, didn't know what I had. I was running, I was searching, but every place I turned for healing left me more broken than the last. Take me back to the place that feels like home, to the people I can depend on, to the faith that's in my bones. Take me back
assistant. Oh, goodness. He's going to be bringing the microphone around tonight so you can hand this to your water back so that I don't have to reiterate those things. Let's try that. Does that work? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I made all those announcements to the people online, and they didn't hear any of that. So that's great. Um, so real quickly, tonight, if you're following along online, we're going to show a video. And if it cuts out, give it just a couple minutes. We'll have it back up and online for you. Tonight, we're going to be using the microphone so that I don't have to repeat everything to the people that are online. They can give the testimonies and a prayer request right onto the microphone, and that will save us some time of going back and forth. Juan, start us off tonight. I'd like to make a prayer request for Teresa Miletti, a really good friend of ours who is diagnosed. Um, she's going through chemotherapy right now. Just today, she had a, a session of chemo, and um, I just wanted to lift her up to God and have us pray for her and hope she gets fine. All right. Teresa well, Miletti. Yes, sir. Somebody else tonight? Word of praise or prayer request? And we'll wait for lovely Vanna White here to make her way over. We've got Miss Joanne and then over to Dan. I have a praise. Um, my daughter-in-law, Lisa, um, took her real estate test today and she was very hesitant and very kind of scared. But she passed, so hallelujah. Praise, Praise the, the Lord. Lord. Good, good news. All right, and then Dan, I think, had his hand up there. Um, <clears throat> my sister Beth uh, had to go to the doctor, and they found uh, a spot. And uh, now they got to do a biopsy, and so kind of pray for her, will you please? Definitely. Dan's sister Beth. All right. Michael Smith passed the day before yesterday and prayed for the Arquette family, which is my niece. She passed this morning with a heart attack, massive heart attack. Also keeping me as in prayer and as my family, but I go back on my eyesight on the 30th of this month. All right. The Smith family, you said the Arquette family? And then you're going back to the doctor for your eyes. Got it. Yep. I have a praise. All right, go ahead, Miss Anita. In this one hand, this hand of mine, I have so many problems with this hand. First, I had the bones sticking out, and Pastor Jason prayed for it, and it healed. It's gone. And then, then the night is came, all my hand here, I couldn't even lift it. I cannot even carry a baby in my school. So my, my doctor said, stop working if you want to be healed. I said, how am I going to stop working? I have to pay my bills. Mm -hmm. said, well, that's my advice. Take it or you're going to suffer. I said, no, I will continue, and I'm going to pray to God that it's going to be healed. I said, Lord, just help me. I have tendernitis, and then I have swollenness here in the arm. And then I asked Pastor Jason to pray for it. And now all my hand now is healed. It's gone. Nothing here. So it's healed. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's Thank fantastic. God. That's good. Uh, Patricia just asked us to continue to pray for Melissa Hyatt as well. She's still in the hospital, and she gave that request Thank last week. Know. It's touch and go at this point, so let's continue that. All right, Janelle, and then, uh, yep, Michelle, go ahead. Hi. I have an, an unspoken I praise. Know. Yeah, keep it up oh, close. Can, it's okay, hard to I, hear. I can hear myself. Um, I have an unspoken praise request. All right. I don't want to get involved in stuff with it, but very, very happy. Um, also, a prayer request I had told you before about losing my insurance because I'm an unscrupulous agent. The person that helped me with it was also unscrupulous. So now I have zero medical coverage for the next month. I'm going to be off my mental health meds, all of my pain meds. It's going to get ugly. So I'm just praying for the strength to get through all this. And then at the start of the next month, will things... Hopefully, okay. it, but it'll take all month to get everything caught back up. So, I can't. Huh. Well, we're going to keep... Praise the Lord that he's working things out, but we're going to keep you lifted up as you make this transition for the month. That's difficult. Maybe this will be a good thing, though, Janelle, 
it gets you kind of a fresh start, and you'll kind of know where you're at. And okay, well, we'll keep you lifted up for sure. Michelle wants everybody to keep her in prayer. Also, Dog Frosty, the mini pincher that I rehomed with her, he got gone. Somebody stole him. I contact the police. Make a long story short, we found him at the dog pound. Take him to Dr. Day, and his heart's better. Thank you, God. Praise the Lord. We're thankful for that, too. Do you know that God cares about even the small things in our lives? Michelle, I know it. I got this tiny little chihuahua at home, and I love that. Her, yep, her name is Piglet, but I call her Pig. She's my little pig. She's actually a chihuahua. She's just a little chihuahua. She's actually a little mutt of a chihuahua. But that little dog is my dog. She curls up and sleeps with me. She goes everywhere that I go. She follows me. Uh, what's that? Piglet. Her name is Piglet, like on Winnie the Pooh, right? On Winnie the Pooh. Because when we first got her, she was this timid little thing, right? And so we thought, oh, what a perfect name, Piglet. That fits her. And that dog is the biggest pig I have ever met in my life. She'll eat anything all the time. Yes, yeah, she rolls in the dirt. She rubs her belly on the ground. She loves being outside. Um, she's a little, and she makes this grunting noise too. Um, she sounds like a little pig. But I'll tell you this: she is my little baby. I take her to Home Depot with me and Lowe's, and she's just awesome. I love her to pieces. And so when something happens to her. Your heart just goes out there, and the Lord cares about those things that we care about. And so praise the Lord today that, uh, you know, he was there looking out for you, Michelle, and your little dog. All right, and you as well. I know that losing them is difficult, but we'll definitely do that. Robert, you got one too? Hold on, hold on, hold on. You got to do it in the microphone. No. <laughs> Remember, we prayed for Miss, Miss Shirley. David went to school with her. She works at the other food bank. She had the $1,800 water bill because it broke. Well, they cut it in half. So she was very thankful. Well, we're thankful, too. Maybe we should pray that they cut the other half in half. Yeah. That still seems like a lot, and it wasn't really her fault. But... All right. Well, praise the Lord that he's worked that out and that they are at least helping that situation a little bit. David, I didn't see Lorraine tonight, but do you have an update on uh, Miss Mar uh, Madeline? We've had good days and bad days. Uh, if Lorraine and I get to talk to someone, and we talked to the social service lady the other day, and she was very concerned, and she said that she would be investigating why things weren't going like they should. That day, everything went smoothly. But then, you know, they drop off, evidently, short-term memory. But they have tentatively set the 18th, which would be next Thursday, for her to be moved to the uh, assisted living facility. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of things to get done between then and now and then, but uh, that's the tentative update that I got word this afternoon. Fantastic. Well, at least things are moving in the right direction. Please keep Miss Madeline in your prayers. She could definitely use it right now. And um, this whole transition, uh, moving her from the rehab facility into assisted living is going to be a big transition for her as well. And I think that Bob, her son, is going to be coming down possibly to help with that. And so just keep that whole situation uh, in your prayers, if you would. Somebody else today? We've got them going. We're working on it. Anybody else today? Word of praise or prayer request? Keep Juan in prayer. Juan? Keep Juan in prayers. We can definitely do that. Thank you. I have a prayer before, too. You, you waited till she gave it? <laughs> Go ahead. Just give it, Robert. Praise the Lord. I know. That's pretty, that's pretty neat. That's cool. I'm thankful. So I really had a good supper tonight. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Praise the Lord. Oh, tonight, um, uh, some of you guys saw 
And I appreciate it. You know what? I haven't heard a lick of complaint from you guys, and I'm just so thankful. Um, the kids have got, you know, half the yard sectioned off for them to goof off and play games and that kind of stuff. And it's kind of inconvenienced us to have to park in different places and maybe walk a little bit more. But tonight, as I was kind of out there just before service started, they're getting ready to have a war um, in the front yard, which I think is kind of fun to begin with. But it, uh, did you guys happen to see the group of teenagers that we had out there? It's pretty awesome. Uh, the group is growing. They're in the middle of a competition series. They've broken the youth group up into two separate teams, and they're kind of battling each other, obviously physically, as well as um, within their spiritual realm. Um, Pastor Nick and the leadership, Alexi and Cameron and Jolyn and Matthew, have challenged the kids to, to do Bible reading every day um, as part of their challenge. So they're all signed up on an app. And Pastor Nick and the leadership can see when they're reading and what they've read. They have to take notes and give those in and, and turn those in. They're doing Bible memorization. Uh, they're inviting friends. And they get points for everything that they do. And tonight, when I looked out there, I was like, it's working. It's working. We got new kids. They're, they're doing exciting things. And um, actually, this week, uh, with Drayden was in there, and he was time for bed. And of course, I, I'm not sure if it was really... Um, spiritual fervor, or it was just he didn't want to go to bed, but he got time for bed, and we're like, all right, get in there, and he's like, oh, I forgot to do my team point devotions, daddy, I got to stay up later, (laughs) and then, you know, it's like one of those places there, too, where as a dad, I'm like, is he just working the system, or does he really want to do this, but uh, so it's been one of those things that we've seen even at the house, and I'm excited for it, so the reason I tell you that is Number one, to brag on our kids a little bit, it's good to see our young people getting connected and interested in in the things of Christ, but the other thing is to keep them in prayer too. Man, this younger generation has got to deal with a lot, and they are inundated with stuff every single day, and when they have these positive opportunities for positive peer environments and to be inundated with Jesus Christ, His Word, and Scripture— we need to take those opportunities, and we need to be praying over those that they sink in, that they grab hold, that they make a difference. And so I'm excited about what God is doing in our youth there as well. Over the next couple of weeks, too, you're going to get an opportunity. Um, when they return from camp, um, they're going to have the service, and they're going to share with you what God is doing, how he's working and moving. So I'm looking forward to that. So keep them lifted up. They got a lot of spiritual things that are kind of lined up in a row here as they lead into the summer months. And in the mid of June, they're going to be heading to camp. And so those are typically really powerful times for these young people. So keep them. Keep them in your prayers. All right, last opportunity. Well, maybe not the last opportunity, but before we switch gears, anybody else praise or prayer request on your heart? Unspoken. Go ahead, Michelle. Definitely. Let's remember Barbara Dean there, if you guys will. Keep her lifted up and in your prayers. Um, After losing a a child, she's also having still some heart complications. Unspoken requests there, too. All right. Well, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you again for today and the wonderful privilege that we've had to be together. God, I thank you for this amazing group of men and women who have chosen to be here tonight. God, I thank you for the ladies in the back who have prepared the meal this evening as well. God, they're given of their time and their talents, God, to to bless us. And Lord, I'm so thankful for them tonight. Lord, uh, as we are here this evening as well, we want this service to be about you. Lord, we want it to be dedicated to you. Lord, we want to have an opportunity to dive a little deeper tonight than maybe what we normally do on a Sunday morning, an opportunity to share a little bit, to be able to give our input, to see things from different perspectives. And so, Lord, tonight, lead us, guide us. Lord, help us uh, through the, the message time this evening as we dive into your word. I pray that you would just help us to grab a hold of it, that we would respond to it, God, in the way that you've called us to, and that, Lord, it would just be something that, that really helps to encourage us and challenge us and grow us deeper in our walk, in our life, and relationship with you. Lord, I pray that tonight you would just settle upon our hearts as well and that, Lord, you would speak, God, not only to us, but, Lord, that you would hear our message, uh, Lord, our thoughts. 
Lord, that you would hear our request today, that you would see our hearts in, the, in a way that, Lord, those things that are burdening are keeping us tonight, that, Lord, we would just be able to turn those over to you. Lord, we made a list of some of those things this evening. Lord, uh, we talked about Lord, um, the Arquette family, um, Melissa Hyatt, Lord, uh, we kind of mentioned some unspoken requests tonight. Lord, and there were others there too that we kind of brought to the surface there that we've been praying for. Lord, Miss Madeline is one of those that we have, uh, Lord, been kind of lifting up as well. Lord, I know that Marilyn is homesick tonight as well, and that, Lord, our church has just got some things, Lord, that are going on that need your attention. God, I think of BJ tonight and Gary who are watching from home and that, Lord, uh, you know all that's been going on there as well. And, Lord, I just pray that you would settle down with every request that has been given tonight. That, Lord, you would just settle into each one of those individually and that, Lord, you would just do as you see fit. And, Lord, you know, uh, you know what's best. And so, Lord, tonight we just want to trust that, Lord, you've got it under control. That, Lord, you're going to handle it. Lord, we want to hand it over to you tonight. And, Lord, we're asking that whether that be some physical or spiritual or emotional God need or concern, that, Lord, you would just meet those tonight. That, Lord, you would hold them up and, and that, Lord, we would be able to give you praise and honor and glory. Lord, tonight we also uh, kind of open today uh, with this opportunity to give praise. And, Lord, we've been seeing some really good things. Lord, we see that your hand is still working and moving and showing up in our lives and Lord, today we just want to say thank you for that as well. Lord, for the rest of this service, would you, Lord, just have your will in your way in everything that is said and done tonight. Lord, we just turn it over to you. And Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I've got a question for you tonight, kind of as we get started into the message series. Uh, we started last week um, regarding the life of David. And when we were in there talking last week, we kind of talked about um, that we, as uh, maybe human beings, have got an issue. We have a tendency to judge based on what we see, right? First appearances, what's on the outside, is what typically draws us in. And sometimes, even before we know it, we've made judgment calls uh, based on those first impressions. And what we uncovered last week was simply this, is that God doesn't look on the outward appearance. He looks to the heart, right? Right? And the challenge for us last week is that we've got to get past looking at the outside, and we've got to take the time and the effort to get to know what's on the inside. We need to care about what's on the inside more so than what we do on the outside. Today, I want to continue with this life of David. Last week, David was called and anointed by Samuel, right? And David was kind of the least of them. And as a result of that, he was the last one in the row, in fact, they went through all of the other brothers, and he says, hey, is this all of your sons? He says, well, there's still one left, but he's out, and he's taking care of the sheep, right? Well, go get him. Bring him back in. And the moment that he walked in, the Lord said, that's the one, right? And so David had a calling, an anointing on his life. You're going to hear that again in a couple of weeks. The Lord has led me in that direction, and on Sunday mornings, I'm going to preach a series entitled, Called and Anointed. Uh, for us. Uh, it was powerful for me, so be on the lookout for that. Um, David is called and anointed in that moment by the Lord himself. It's pretty awesome tonight. And then, very shortly after this, we read another story that is very familiar tonight. All right? How many of you have ever heard the name Goliath? If you've ever been in Sunday school... <laughs> You've probably heard that, right? Now remember, remember, the temptation is, oh no, I've already heard this a million times. It's easy to check out tonight. But what we've been doing on Wednesday night is trying to look from different perspectives, right? Get down to the meat, the heart of the matter. And tonight, I want to share with you guys uh, this little story that I think is going to be familiar, but I want to ask you a question to be thinking on before we get to it, all right? We're going to ask this question, we're going to watch a small video, and then we're going to get into Scripture tonight and pull it apart a little bit. So here's the question. What do you do when you are confronted with crises? When you experience or encounter big things in your life, right? And I don't mean like the mountaintop experiences. I mean that you're in grave danger, 
Maybe when the Lord speaks to you and he says, like he did to me, I want you to take your two-year-old and your four-year-old and I want you to pack up your stuff, I want you to move away from your family, and I want you to move to a place that you can hardly pronounce that you've never been to and that you don't know anybody there, right? Um, Move to Coshocton, Ohio, and I want you to start pastoring there full-time. I want you to leave your job that you're comfortable with, that you're going to make more than twice what you're going to make there, and I want you to support your family and do that. And I thought to myself, that was a giant. Like, Lord, what are you doing? This doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make financial sense. It doesn't make sense that I would leave my family in my comfort places, right? What do you do when the doctor sits you down and says, hey, we've got some test results back? and they're not looking good. How do you respond in the midst of crises when you are standing before the giants of your life? That's what I want you to think about tonight. And if you will, I want you to give your attention here. Uh, Robert, want to do me a favor? Can you get the lights for me back there? We're going to dim those down so that... Yeah, dim the lights down for us, please. And uh, Mr. Dennis, if you've got that video, if we can play that, that would be fantastic.
Dennis, you can go ahead and pull it down from there. That's a pretty awesome picture, isn't it? Robert left, too. He didn't turn the lights back on for us. Dennis, can you grab those for me as well? <laughs> he just left. Um, tonight uh, gives us a really good picture uh, there uh, from a couple of different perspectives. In fact, I might try to draw on both of those. Um, this little cub, this is actually a 1988 film entitled The Bear, and it kind of follows this little bear that is abandoned, this little cub, and actually ends up getting adopted by a big Kodiak bear that you saw there in the background. And during the little cub's life, he's kind of growing up, and through that growing up process, he learns basically everything that he knows by imitating the big bear, right? His adopted daddy, and that big Kodiak bear, when he's out there and, and they're going through the bushes, he learns what to eat and what not to eat, right? When they're fishing, he's watching the big daddy bear there to scoop up the fish and catch them as they're coming up the river streams. When he has an itch, he sees that daddy bear, you know, scratch up against the back of the tree. And, and everything that he does has been what he has seen, you know, from the father figure there. And when he's confronted with this lion, right, this mountain lion, he's in a panic. He's frantic. He doesn't really know what to do. He's running. He's doing everything that he can. And when he's backed into the corner, he remembers what his daddy did. His daddy stands up on all fours and lets out this, you know, this amazing roar to try and scare off the predator. And as he's there on that little rock, right, he gets up and he lets out that howl. Now, it's not really intimidating um, as that little cub is, but it's what he had seen. It's what he knew to do. And unbeknownst to him, right, as he lets out this roar, that mountain lion turns around and runs off. And what he doesn't see is what the mountain lion saw, that behind him was that big old daddy bear standing up on, you know, two legs there, letting out his roar. And you know what? Tonight, I think that there is a great lesson to be learned in that little picture. But before we come back to that, I want to share with you, uh, I think, a similar situation with my buddy David. So if you've got your Bibles with you, I want you to turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now, my plan is not to spend a whole lot of time reading through the Scripture because I think that you guys will know the story already. But I do want to pinpoint a few things tonight um, directly from Scripture, and I think it's much better when it comes from the Lord instead of Pastor Jason. So we're going to go right to Scripture tonight. 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're going to start at verse 1. We're going to read, I think, about the first 11 verses, and then um, we'll, we'll see kind of where we get to after that. So here we go. Verse 1, 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting at verse 1. The Philistines now mustered their army for battle and camped between Soko and Judah and Azekah at um, Ephes Demin. These are great names uh, here. Saul countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. So the Philistines and Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with a valley between them. So you're getting the picture here, right? They're on two hillsides. There's a valley between them. Neither one of them want to give up the high ground because they know that it's a strategic advantage. So they've posted up on either hillside, and they're ready to go to war, to go to battle. Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. That's a big boy. Amen? I was hoping that Rudy might be here today. I was going to have him play a part for us. If you guys have met Rudy Rivero, he normally sits over here on this side, and he's a big guy. He's, a big, he's intimidating, like if you kind of get there. Um, he's, a, he's just like a giant teddy bear uh, in real life, but he looks opposing, right? And he's nowhere near nine feet tall. So this guy is huge. He wore a bronze helmet, and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. That's more than Missy weighs. That's like putting her on as a coat. I'm saying that's a pretty big guy, right? He also wore bronze leg armor, and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. 
The shaft of his spear was heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. I don't know, Dad, I know that you have. Is there anybody else in here that has swung like a 20-pound sledgehammer? Robert, that's as big as you are. (laughs) You couldn't swing it very much. Man, if you've ever even just picked one up, that's a lot of heft to it. And swinging that thing around or utilizing it in a way that's going to be productive, you've got to have some strength to it. So him having this here with a 15-pound head on it means that this guy had some, some muscle. Um, he had some thickness to him because he was going to utilize this in a way that he was going to battle with. So it, all we're doing is getting a little picture of this guy. And what we're saying is he's a big guy, he's intimidating, he's strong, he's powerful. And what do you guys know about did you see did you notice what kind of metal it was that he was wearing? Bronze. And so bronze, what does it look like? It does, and it's polished really well. Yes. And so can you imagine this guy coming out, decked out head to toe in this bronze armor, shined to the hilt, and he's carrying this spear. I mean, he's he's a presence to behold, right? He's got all of the showmanship already worked out. He knows that he's bigger than probably anybody else on the entire army on the other side. And then to top that off, they've given him this regalia, right? This presence that just says, you don't want to mess with me, right? Right? All right, his armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. All right, he didn't even have to carry it himself. Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites, Why are you all coming out to fight? He called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him... You will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. All right, so let me, let me just, we're going to recap here a moment. They're on the hillsides. They're prepping for battle. They're ready to go to a great war. And then this giant, Goliath, comes out and he says, listen, there's no need for war. Just bring your best man. I'm their best man. And the one who wins decides this whole war. All you got to do is send me one. He's taunting them, though, as well. And what we don't read it here maybe as much um, from this particular um, version is the taunting that is taking place here really is against Israel, but also against Israel's pride, Israel's um, valley, its land, and Israel's God. This was uh, defiance against what God had already promised the Israelite people. And the Philistine army is coming back here, right? And they're saying, hey, we're going to take what you're standing on. And these taunts that are being given there is basically saying, hey, if your God is so big and he has given this over to you, just send me one. Prove it. And how do the Israelite people respond? They are shaken in their boots. They are afraid. They're saying, you know what? A lot rides on this. We can send one man out there and they can fight, but if they lose, that means we all lose, right? And we see this confident, tormenting guy in Goliath who says, Why are you all chickening out? Just send one guy. And and here's here's what I want you to be thinking about. Remember the question that I asked at the beginning. How do you respond in crisis? Right? Well, when we see the Israelite people, the way that they first respond is in fear. They're like, oh no. And what they start doing in this moment is they start doubting the God that they have had on their side all of this time. They start looking to man and they say, which man is good enough to beat the other man that's on the other side? They stop forgetting about who has been with them throughout the entirety of this this kingship. And 
They're afraid. And I would dare to say today that some of us who are sitting in here, our first response to crisis in our lives is fear. We start thinking all about the what ifs. What if this happens? What if this takes place? What if I don't? What if I can't? What if, and we go through this myriad of questioning. Amen? We do that, don't we? Almost immediately we go to fear. All right, I want us to continue tonight. I want us to look a little bit further. Dennis, um, I'll just click us through and, and I'll stop us when we need to. <clears throat> now, David was a son of a man named Jesse, an, Eph, uh, an Ephrathite. That sounds great, right? From Bethlehem in the land of Judah. Jesse was an old man at that time, and he had eight sons. We already learned about them. Jesse's three oldest sons, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shimea, had already joined Saul's army to fight the Philistines. David was the youngest son. David's three oldest brothers stayed with Saul's army. But David went back and forth so that he could help his father with the sheep in Bethlehem. For 40 days, every morning and in evening, the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army. And one day, Jesse said to David, take this basket of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers. And give these 10 cuts of cheese to their captain. See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they're doing. Jesse says, go check on your brothers. Take some food, take some stuff, right? But get a report. Tell me how things are going. All right? David's brother with, were with Saul and the Israelite army at the Valley of Elah, fighting against the Philistines. So David left the sheep with another shepherd and set out early the next morning with the gifts, as Jesse had directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and battle cries. Soon the Israelite and Philistine forces stood facing each other, the other army, uh, army against army. David left his things with the keeper of supplies and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks. Then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Stop right there for a moment, and I want you again, pay attention to how the Israelite people respond. Now listen, this isn't just the Israelite people. Who is this? This is the king's army. These are suited up men in battle regalia who are getting ready to go out and fight, and then Goliath steps out onto the field, and what do they do? They run. They run away. My goodness. Yes, they have given in to fear completely. And listen, let me tell you this. This might be another step that we have a tendency to do when we encounter crisis. Not only do we get afraid, but sometimes we run from it. We see it, and it seems unsurmountable. It seems overwhelming. It looks like something bigger than we can handle or even process at times. And our response is, let's get out of here. Let's run. All right, let me keep going. Verse um, 25. Um, Have you seen the giant, the men asked. He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters for a wife, and the man's entire family will be exempted from paying taxes. <laughs> Robert, I'm, you're signing up, huh? Free from taxes. Uh, David asked the soldier standing nearby, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy armies of the living God? Man, that's powerful there. You know, you know what David's saying? What is the deal? Who does this guy think he is? Who gave him authority in this place? This doesn't belong to him. Why are we standing back here cowering? Why are we running away? Who is this man that he thinks he's got something on my God? Right? He says it. The armies of the living God. His... Faith in that moment has not been shaken. 
He saw him, he heard him, and his shouts out there. And while everybody else was running away, David's like, what are we doing? What is happening right now? Why is this going down this way, right? Who is this Philistine that he would stand or defy, be allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Let's go, verse 27. And these men gave David the same reply. They said, yes, that is the reward for killing him. But when David's oldest brother Eliab heard David talking with the men, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway? Right? This is like I, this is what I picture. You little squirt. Why are you even out here? Get home. Right? His older brother's like, why are you even here? All right? He demanded, what about those few sheep that you're supposed to be taking care of? Stop. That was a stab right there. You little twerp. You shouldn't be here on the battlefield. Where are your little sheep? Get back home and take care of them. You don't need to be here, right? I feel like this is big brother, little brother type of stuff here. I can tell, or at least what I maybe suppose from reading this, is that his bigger brother wasn't very happy about him being there. All right? You're supposed to be taking care of the sheep, right? I know about your pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. You're only here because you want to pry. You just came here. You snuck out. You came over here just so you could see what was going on. Right? Now listen, David wasn't there of his own accord. Right? He was there why? His dad told him to. Right? He was to go and get a report and he was to bring the stuff for him there. So David wasn't out there of his own accord. Verse 29. What have I done now? David replied. I was only asking a question, right? Hey, man, get off my back. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm just talking. I'm not causing any trouble. I'm not getting in any problems. He walked over to some of the others and asked them the same thing and received the same answer. So here's here's what you're getting from this, is that David is going around and he's saying, hey, why are we being so afraid? Why aren't we standing up to this guy? Why isn't anything being done? The king is even offering reward And yet, nobody's willing to stand up. And he's going around and he's asking different soldiers there about this. And he's getting the same response. Which means that there's a general consensus among the soldiers. To run, to be afraid. At the very least, it's this. We can't do this. We can't beat him. Right? Why haven't we done anything? Because we can't. Nothing that we can do. We're going to run. We're going to hide. We're going to be afraid. We're going to stay on this side. Yeah, they weren't even willing to step into that. Verse 31. Then David's question was reported to King Saul, and the king sent for him. This, This bothers me a little bit, because as a king and the leader of this army, if I was standing back and I was watching this over the last 40 days... I would. I'd be afraid. Of, I'd be ashamed of me, my military prowess. I'd be ashamed of my people, my men who are supposed to be on the front lines helping to protect the kingdom. My goodness, what kind of soldiers do I have? And so there's these murmurs going through the ranks, and David, this little boy, is up there and he's saying, Why aren't we doing something about this? Send somebody out there, right? Let's take care of this. This is the army of the Lord, isn't it? We better do something about it. And so David's kind of running his mouth out there to it. And word gets back to Saul, right? The king. And he hears it. And listen to this. Listen to the response. After Saul gets word of this, he calls for David. And David responds to the king now. And here's what he says. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Now listen, my my thought here is there's a fine line. All right? And and I think that we've got to determine this today. Because, well, here's what I'm thinking. How much of this response, go back one verse for me if you will, David. uh, Dennis, sorry. Um, How much of David's response there is childhood bravado? I heard, I heard two uh, uh, conflicting answers there today. 
I heard somebody say 110%, and I heard the other side say none. Yes, we're forgetting David's past experience. We're not taking into consideration what he's already accomplished in his lifetime. Well, th- yeah, not yet. It's coming. Um, but yeah, this is kind of foreshadowing of that because we're seeing this. If the king is re- leading this kind of regiment, obviously he's not where he should be. Um, as the leader. So this is definitely foreshadowing of that there too. Um, Listen, I can't answer you for 100% how much of this was bravado. I think that as young people, and especially from my perspective as a young man, um, there were things that I thought that I could do. And that's right. I think that's well said there, Dennis. I was 10 foot tall and bulletproof. I was more reserved than many. In fact, I think my sister, Katrina, was 11 foot tall and bulletproof. Um, She had a little more bravado than I did at times. Um, But you know what I do? I remember being dumb. I just remember taking chances that I shouldn't have taken. Um, I remember driving cars faster than I should have, being on motorcycles, seeing if the, the speedometer would actually go all the way to the other side. Just had to see if it would do it. You know what? And I'm thinking about those things now uh, with children, and, and you know, and I'm thinking, man, how dumb was he? You were dumb, Jason. I think those things sometimes. And maybe if you kind of look back through your life, you can remember moments when you did the same. So I'm not alone in here uh, tonight. And so there may have been a little bit of childhood bravado, but I think more so that there is just this unwavering faith in who his God is. God has brought me through, right? I've been up against the bears, and I've been up against the lions, and you know what? They don't faze me because I know who's on my side. And what he's really doing here when he is confronting Saul, he's saying, you have forgotten. Do you not remember who put you in this position? Do you not remember who has brought you through all of the things that you've encountered in the past? Do you know why you're the king sitting here on the hillside going up against them? Because the God of heaven has ordained it and stood behind you and walked you through every single one of these. In fact, when we start to watch David and he comes to this place where he says, hey, I'm going to go fight him, right? Saul's response really says where his faith is once again. In fact, I'm going I'm to skip from this because i only got a few minutes left here today, guys. But here's what he says. He says, all right, we're going to let you do this, little man. You've got some spunk. You've got some fire, and you are confident, and we're going to put this in you. I think this says a couple of things. Number one, that means for the last 40 days, there wasn't a single person, a single man who was in that military regiment who he thought was capable or was willing to step up. And when this little boy comes in, now listen, he's probably not a little boy. He's probably a teenager at this time. But in that breath, he's not like the older kids. His older brothers are in there. And remember when he, we were told about it in Samuel, when Samuel comes in, some of the other boys are big and strong and handsome, and they kind of look the part like they're supposed to be those military guys. We know that David was the youngest, the least of these, Right? And so he didn't have the physique that maybe some of the older boys did, which means that there were probably other men in that regiment there too, and none of them stood up. None of them were willing. Yeah, some of them we should have been, you know, not just those young men, but older men as well, those that had combat experience. And here's this little boy from a town who was tending to sheep who comes up and says, hey, I'll fight him. Listen, Saul had to have been in a desperate situation to turn around and say, all right, you do it. And the second thing that Saul does is he says, all right, well, let's suit you up. You take my armor. Do you know why the king would say that? Well, I think that in his mind he's thinking, my armor is the best armor. I've had these crafted specially for me. 
And you know what? When they did that, there was no expense spared on the kings, right? The ones that they were giving out to all of the soldiers didn't meet the same standards that the kings did. So the king says, I'm going to give you the best that man has to offer. You understand that? Maybe this will help keep you protected. Maybe this will help keep you safe. Maybe my stuff. Go ahead, Miss Robin. Oh, that's a good point. Maybe going out there. Yeah, I don't know. We don't know what their builds were. So potentially, maybe he says, if you take this and you wear this, you can go out there and it might look like the king is going out. That is a good thought. I wonder. Maybe he's trying to steal some glory here, maybe. I don't know. We read into things, but it's a good thought for certain. What we do know is that when David tries to put it on, he says, ain't happening. It's too big, it's too bulky, it's too heavy, I can't do anything. I'm just going to go out there and die. Pastor Waymar, did you have your... I thought I saw your hand. All right. I didn't mean to pick on you then. <laughs> he is out there and he says, just this, this isn't going to happen. We just can't do this. And he goes back to his old faithful, right? He says, I got my sling. And he walks down you know, to the river. He pulls out some stones right? He's meticulous about them too. He wants them to be rounded. He wants them to be just right. And you know that he's done this many a times. And the long story short, he goes out there onto the battlefield. He says, well, thank you. Let's see it. I'd rather say it from him. Verse 45, if you will. Goliath walked out towards David with his shield bearer ahead of him. I want you to think about this for a moment too, all right? He's been out here taunting the Israelite army for the last 40 plus days, right? Not a single man would stand up or come back out there. And then finally, 40 days into this, they send out a little boy. And David comes walking out there with his sling, no armor, nothing to protect himself, and we've got decked out Goliath standing on the other side. Tell me, what do you think Goliath thought? This is a joke, yes. This is a joke. Well, he says it, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy, right? He's, he's, he's happy at this moment. He's like, this is going to be easy. I'm going to take this little boy out, and we are going to have control of the entire army right? I ask for them to send me a man, they send me a boy, and I'm getting ready to show this, right? Uh, he's, he's ready. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. He's starting this place of intimidation, can I say this again? If we step back again, I feel like when we are confronted with crisis in our lives, so many times the enemy thinks that they've got the upper hand. In fact, they want to get in our face and they want to yell these obscenities. They want to tell you, want to make sure that you're afraid. They want to make sure that you understand what it is that's about to happen. What they're trying to do is invoke fear, right, in those moments. They don't want you to stand. They want you to feel like you're a joke. Amen? Amen? David replied to the Philistine, You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. I get goosebumps when I read that. Because listen, David doesn't come back and say, Boy, you're talking too big for your britches. Right? He doesn't come back and say, You just met your match. And he's not holding on to his straps here kind of tooting his own horn, is he? He's not coming back and saying, you have just met the greatest hero of all time. You, you know, I am a great swordsman. I'm a great... He doesn't come back and have anything to say about himself at all. In fact, what he does is he says, hey, buddy, you're in trouble because you just picked a fight, not with me, but with my daddy. Right? You thought you got the baby bear. But you forgetting who's behind me. It's powerful tonight. 
Man, David doesn't waver. And this is part of the reason why I don't think that this is all childhood bravado. Because he doesn't come back and tell him how good he is. He comes back and says, let me tell you about my God. Let me tell you why you're about to lose. Not because of me, not because of my power, not because of my authority, buddy. But because of who you chose to fight with. I'm just his representative. Man, that's powerful. Today... Listen to his words. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head, and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Can you imagine if we might have some people today who are willing to stand up in the name of the Lord and call things out like that? Instead of giving in, instead of just uh, laying down. Listen. This world today that we live in is standing on the other hillside shouting. It's saying, hey, we've got this. This world belongs to us. And you know what? I feel like so many times as Christians, we're standing on the other side cowering. Oh, look, they got all those big numbers and they got all those big money and they got all those big backers. And we're just lonely Christians standing over here on the other hillside. What what can we do against them? Man, what if? What if we just stood up and proclaimed the name of Jesus Christ? Verse 47, And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. Listen, David, man, he spouts some powerful words right here. And I can feel the anointing of the Lord upon him. He knew what God was getting ready to do. And I want you to take notice of this too. David doesn't get up there to gloat or to have glory at all. In fact, he's doing what he's doing so that God might receive the glory. Do you see that? He's saying, listen, he doesn't say, everyone's going to know my name when we're done from here. They're going to shout my praises. They're going to sing my name because I just defeated the giant Goliath. He says, after this is done, everyone's going to know that the Lord did this. Man, that's awesome, isn't it? He says, not me, him, right? Not me, him. That's powerful for me tonight. Guys, I need to wrap this up this evening. And I started tonight by asking you, how do you respond in the midst of crises? When you face Goliath. You see, I think that we as human beings and even as Christians sometimes are tempted to be on the other hillside cowering, wondering about all the what ifs. I think we're tempted to run when we are confronted by those things. And sometimes it isn't until we're backed into the corner and we're forced to do something that then we turn to the one who can change the circumstances. Remember that video that we started with tonight, that little cub? That little cub was running around wild and crazy and he was getting swiped at and hurt, right? And when he was finally backed into that corner, he then did what he had been taught to do. And that's when daddy showed up. And I wonder how many of us are getting beat up in life and through life's circumstances and crises because we're worried and we're running and we're afraid. When really what we need to do is do what we've been taught to do all along to stand up in the name of our Father, to be bold, to be in this position where we're willing to stand up knowing that he's got it under control. Listen, you might feel like that little cub, kind of lost and alone, and what can my little voice do, right? But man, When our Father, our Heavenly Father, is in our corner and He stands up behind us, that makes a difference, doesn't it? Tonight I'm telling you that God hasn't left your corner. 
that he's still standing beside you. And regardless of what it is that you might be facing today in your life, regardless of what crises or giant you might be facing today, there is a God in heaven who is bigger, who is stronger, who is more powerful, who has the answers, who can walk you through that in ways that you never thought possible. What it takes is believing that he's got this. It's following in his footsteps. It's doing what he's already taught you and prepared you to do through this. And if we're willing to listen to the voice of our Heavenly Father and just simply do what he's called us to do, you will find that he will step up. David steps back there, and he's got all these stones in his pocket just in case, right? He's prepared. But how many does it take? Just one. Just one. And he slings that little rock, and down comes the giant. Man, you ain't kidding, he rang his bell. And then he walks over there, takes Goliath's own sword, and chops his head off with it. I'm telling you, that's powerful. And today, we serve the same God. You may not have the fancy armor. You may not be the king of your palace. You may not have the best that the world has to offer. Maybe today you feel like all you got is a sling and a rock. Can I tell you it's enough? Amen. It's enough. Whatever it is that God has given you, whatever it is that he has placed within your hands, if you will give it to him, he can use it. And he can do things that nobody else could. He can make a difference. He can turn things around. He can slay the giant in your life today. Can I pray with you tonight? Go ahead, Pablo. That's right. The battle belongs to him. Yeah, sometimes we just got to get out of the way. Sometimes we just need to man up and step into the front lines and let him do his work. But yes, ultimately, it is his battle. Amen. Let me pray with you. Go ahead, Mom. You sent it to me today. Yeah. But God, through your prayer, she asked God to help her get out of the hole. God told her to do the work. And he told them, there are stones there, there are sticks there, start building a ladder. And so he got, um, he felt good again, and he felt like he had purpose again, and he started building a ladder. And he built the ladder, and he started to climb up, but it still wasn't a big enough ladder to get out of the hole. And he started to give up again, and God told them um, to don't give up. Absolutely. We can't give up. We can't run from it. Right. Yeah, we have to, we have to put in the effort. We got to do. Yeah, I think of that tonight. Had, had David got there and said, well, look at all these big guys here and none of them can do it. Who am I? Right? Yeah, sometimes we got to do the work. Good word. Good word. Uh, I was going to pray, but let me ask. <laughs> Anybody else tonight? I don't want your heart bubbling over and then you feel like you missed it. All right. I'll get it from you then. I got in a conversation yesterday with a young girl. This man, how I got into it, it had to be by God. Because I didn't know what to say and what to do, but my mouth kept running. And this other woman said, Amen. I learned my King James Version Bible study. Well, well, good. Do you know what? I think that God gives us opportunities all the time to just be and do the things that He's called us to do, to utilize the things that He's blessed us with. Well, good. Praise the Lord. Guys, I just think that we've got to be in this position where we're willing to stand up to the giants that we face and let God do the work. Because when we step in and we do what God has called us to do, that's when we really get to see the power and the authority. It's when we recognize that we can't, that he finally can. 
He can work through us and in us and in our circumstance in ways that we never could of ourselves. And so tonight, remember that. God is on your side. He's big enough, he's strong enough, he's powerful enough, and he cares enough to step in and intercede on your behalf as well. Let me pray with you tonight. Heavenly Father, I just thank you again for this evening. God, I thank you for this amazing group of men and women. God, I thank you for their input again today. God, I thank you for their attentiveness. God, I didn't think, see anybody go to sleep tonight, and I'm thankful for that, even with full bellies. And Lord, uh, the message that we heard tonight is one that we've heard a lot, God, and it would have been easy for us to check out tonight. But Lord, instead, I really feel like you wanted to just encourage us again tonight to let us know that you got us, that, Lord, you are in control And that, Lord, when we face those big things in our lives, that, Lord, we don't have to be afraid. God, we don't have to give in. We don't have to run. But that, Lord, we can stand firm in you. And that, Lord, you're going to handle it. You're going to take care of it. You're going to utilize us. Now, Lord, it probably takes some work on our part. God, we're going to have to be bold at times. God, we're going to have to stand up and and say the things that need to be said. We've got to do the work that needs to be done. But, Lord, if we're willing to listen to you and your voice and your calling, Lord, we can see it through. And, Lord, what remains on the other side is blessing. God, tonight I pray that you would just go with us as we leave from here, that you'd keep us safe and protected, that, Lord, we'd have a great rest of the week in you. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Guys, thank you so much for joining me again tonight. I love you all. You are dismissed. Tear off the roof, the king's in the house. Just get me to Jesus, I don't care how I don't have to wait to get the healing I got a faith without a ceiling So tear off the roof, cause the king's in the house There's power in the presence, power in the blood Power in the name of Jesus There's power in the presence